Today, we're going to dive deep into this idea of the foundations of American democracy. So looking at where do the ideas and where's the genesis of our democracy in America, where are the ideas behind the Declaration of Independence, as well as the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. Thank you, St. Academy, for putting your names in the chat so your teacher can take attendance. But we're here today with me, Curry Sautner from the Natural Constitution Center, but we're also here with one of our top scholars, Nick Mosvick. So Nick, can you say hi to everybody? Hi, I am Nicholas Mosvick, and I am one of our senior fellows in constitutional content. So Nick, you know how much I love this topic today and I'm really excited about it. We're gonna go over these like three big ideas today. The idea of natural rights, and then we'll look at how natural rights feeds into popular sovereignty. And then the, the wrapping around and the understanding of how they all work together with rule of law. So the reason why I love these, this topic today is because it does really explain to us what are the values and what are the big ideas that our country runs off of. So at sometimes we look at laws, we look at ideas that are going through Congress to be written, and we want to say, does this meet the needs? Does this fit who we are as a country and as a people? We can fall back on these three big ideas and say, what are those values and do, how do we believe in them and see them happening in our country? This is, I like to kind of always know where my, my basis is or where my foundation is, like a basement to a house or a basement to a building. So I'll stop punning after that. I promised Nick I wouldn't pun the whole class. Uh, but Nick, where would you like to jump into? Do you want to jump into popular sovereignty, natural rights? What's your favorite or what big idea do you want to get across before we start talking? Well, I mean, should we should we just go over the three big ideas? I, I think that's yeah. how we we like to lay out the three to begin. We we put those in the chat too, but it's uh, it's worth going over those because um not all these are obvious um even natural rights itself right because natural rights as we'll discuss is the idea that um uh there are rights that well for one there are rights that are inalienable that will get us to the declaration of independence that means rights you cannot give away to a government but the idea is that natural rights are rights that you have is a result of being a human being an individual person right that are endowed by uh, God or your creator or uh, by nature. In other words, they're natural to you, um, inherent from your birth, and therefore they are not granted by government. Now that's important because that means you take those rights into uh, entering political society. So you take a step back thinking about natural rights, because we'll get to this when we talk about popular sovereignty too. We're thinking kind of in political theory terms here, right? We're thinking philosophically. So this is the big picture, which is to say there are, uh, there's a state of nature, right? That's a philosophical concept. That's where people are born, where they come from. That's divorced from any political society um, that exists. And then there's how one as a human being lives within political society. So natural rights is saying by birth, regardless of where you are, you have these inherent rights. Why that matters when we talk about rule and law and popular sovereignty is that it also has to do with the powers that government gets. If you believe in popular sovereignty, this is the connection, right? That's we the people. The idea that the people themselves um, are the ultimate source of political power, meaning that it's not monarchy, which is the, the rule of one, right, inherent from birth, um, but not granted by the people. Right or autocracy, for instance, which be um, just rule by power. Right, those concepts um, or aristocracy. Right, the rule by many oligarchy, things like that. Right, the idea here is it's derived from the people. Therefore, the people take their natural rights, enter political society, and create, as we'll talk about, a social contract in which they give away some powers, some rights to the government in exchange for protection. Um, of their rights and uh, the benefits of political society, right? So that's the concept of popular sovereignty. That is how it's connected to natural rights. The connection to rule of law, we talk about that, is um, that, natu that equality of the law itself, right? Um, that the law is not made for anyone's particular benefits or detriment, um, because we have a government of laws, not arbitrary rule, which by the way, that would be eros, um, that would be autocracy um, or 
monarchy, at least tyrannical monarchy, right? Tyranny is arbitrary rule, meaning by the will of another person, right? That's will to power. Rule of law means we have laws. We have a government of laws. No one is above the law and everyone is treated equally, right? For better or worse by the law. Um, and we connect those, right? That means that the law cannot violate those rights you have as the result of being human. You have to be treated the same under the law. And popular sovereignty, the people give up those rights and enter into political society in order to give limited power to a government, not arbitrary power, right? So I say all this just to say from the beginning, we wanna connect these three things together. So it's really important to take them piece by piece, but it's also to see how they come together to complete this puzzle this, uh, is uh, Curry put it, you know, these foundational values that is, we'll see are in both the Declaration and the Constitution. Okay, I'm gonna try to like summarize these three pieces again um, and just correct me or add where I would need clarification. And students, we can do this as well. So if you need clarification, always use that chat and be like, wait, I don't get that. Or I got lost there. Um, Cause it's, we, we understand these are like kind of tricky concepts. But when I think about natural rights and I, you know, I love people like John Locke. We all know I'm like a Locke obsessed. Um, but this idea that because you exist, because you are born, you are given rights that nobody can take away, no matter, no matter where you are, no matter where you go. And so when I, natural rights, I always think of like that nature gave them to me or that by I exist that they give them to me. I know we talk about you're given natural rights either by your creator, so by God or by nature, whatever way you believe it that you're given certain rights and those rights are yours. And now what happens is some of them, nobody can ever touch. No government, no despot, nobody can ever touch in theory that they can't be touched. But some of them, if you live like kind of just think about it like in, in the wild, in the middle of the woods, then you're living under a full natural right. If I wanna enter into society that has a government, that has a town, a community, all those things, I say, okay, I'm okay with giving up some of my rights because I get things back from living in the community. Like I'm safer. I might have a, a more friends. I might have all these other things that communities can give you and governments can give you. So that's like a, a, a contract or a deal you make with living in the community. That's the idea that you still have power in that community. You still have voice, but you're able to have that social contract with a government and still hold on to some of your natural rights, but the ability to tell the government that you're still in charge, that's popular sovereignty. But at the end of the day, I'm still in charge because I made the deal with you to begin with, join you, kind of like a special club. And then finally, the deal that you make with that government, that's the rule of law. And then it should be applied to all of us equally. Now, again, guys, as we go through this, we're looking at these big theories and these big ideas and values, how they play out over time may not be correct by based off of the value or may be correct. But that's what we're gonna go through those stories of how these three have played out over time. But you have some rights that nobody can take away. You have voice and agency and power in your government because it begins with popular sovereignty that people are sovereign, the people are king, queen in charge. And that that rule are written down and transparent for all the people to be applied equally. Those are the three big ideas our country is founded on. Is that summary correct, Nick? Yeah, I think uh, the, the, the only thing I can think of is that uh, a really good example or an easy example for when you're talking about what's an alienable, right? What's one you give away? It's what you said, but to be more explicit, self-defense is one of the easiest examples. Great. Just to say in the state of nature, you have a right to defend yourself and uh, presumably your family. If you enter into political society, then you tend to give that away so that the government offers you protection instead of yourself. Um, and that can have a variety of consequences that can include things like uh, punishment for people who commit crimes. Um, so that's where it gets applied through popular sovereignty and the rule of law. So that just gives, that's just like a nice, clean, easy example of it. We can start with popular sovereignty because that's where the slide goes and we can just no, no, we can follow along. Right, There's too. nothing wrong with that, right? <laughs> <laughs> nothing wrong with that. Um, you know, if we still want to start with popular sovereignty, we can do that. Um, sure, let's go to popular sovereignty because I feel like this is when we talk about the constitution and we look at the constitution and say, how does our government work? What we always need to remember 
is that we the people are, you know, that fourth branch of government, that we have power in that constitution. And it comes from this value that people are sovereign. So let's start there because I feel like that sh- it should be reminded and always strongest. Yeah. And I, I mean, I didn't even say like be, beyond even think of it like a fourth branch, just think of it that every branch has to take its power from the people, right? So that if you read some Supreme Court opinions that are powerful, there's that understanding that ultimately we're here because of popular sovereignty. So we have our own limits. We're going to talk next week about judicial power. Um, what's important to realize, even if you read John Marshall, the great chief, first chief justice, is that the role is limited by the fact that this is we the people. So therefore, um, the courts are limited by that principle. The president is limited by that principle, and so is Congress, right? Because ultimately, the people in charge who give them their power, who grant them these things, who they're responsible towards, right? Think of it that way, right? Is the people, right? Because a king isn't responsible to anybody, right? Ultimately, right? I mean, we think that the... Uh, the people, yes, but they're subjects. This is what Alexander Hamilton would point out. The difference is very important. It's crucial, right? The difference is that, yes, a king to some extent is responsible for his people, um, but more like uh, in a very different way is a subject, right? They're subjects. So you take care of them almost like children, but not like people who have Profit. power, right? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Right? Exactly. So, they're they're your children, you're, you're almost like, <laughs> you're forced in a way, I, I, I have this devotion to them, but I also have a responsibility. But yes. in the idea of like, and we can talk about Locke in a minute, because I mean, uh, Thomas Paine in a minute, because what we a fascinating way <laughs> would just shift it. But exactly. like, no, 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 you got this wrong. We're in charge. <laughs> it's like well, you flip it in the United States. Because if there's anybody who speaks to the um, it's so crucial to think about what a change in 1775 and 1776 this thinking was to not only criticizing monarchy, but saying it was absolutely wrong. And um, that no, no, there's no legitimacy to monarchy. This is what Thomas Paine argued um, in more than one track. You've heard of common sense, but it's not the only thing he wrote in 1776 and not in his life. And he was very clear that um, there was no legitimacy to monarchy because the people are ultimately sovereign. You see this great quote here, a constitution is not the act of a government, but of a people constituting a government. And a government without a constitution is power without right. Right? Because he's, he's talking about this ultimate legitimacy, which is, which is both a moral and a political concept. And he's being clear, right? That, the, look, I mean, it's the people ultimately. We have to look to them. And you're going to say, that sounds like democracy. Well, yes, Thomas Paine was very much taking us quickly on the road towards um, American democracy, which is why we're talking about those foundations, right? Um, It was very important to set that out um, on the onset. So now, just stepping back a second, where does the argument, uh, where does this idea come from, right? This rule by the people, right? So one source is we're talking about here, that's Thomas Paine, right? and common sense and this idea that monarchy is illegitimate and the only legitimate idea is self-rule, rule rule of the people. Um, What are the other sources of that though? Uh, One we've already talked about, which is social contract theory. And without really going deep into that, it's we often talk about the enlightenment and enlightenment political theory. In this case, it's no different, right? There are several, uh, s- several important thinkers who talk about social contract theory. Um, Curry mentioned one of them, that's John Locke. There's also John Jacques Rousseau, um, amongst others, who are talking about this idea of sort of just, it's describing at the abstract level, um, theoretically, how people enter into a political society, because obviously you're born into one, right? But the point is, How is it when you have natural rights, how do you enter a political society and what are the rules? What do you agree upon? How does this work, right? And the idea is people give up some of those rights in order to get protection, but when they do so, the government also has obligations too, right? There's limitations to their power. They have to protect those rights of the people that are inherent in them, right? Um, They have to respect the rule of law, things, things like that, right? So the social contract that binds us is part of the reason why the rule of law is important. 
Um, so we, we see those connections and that theory that's behind um, popular sovereignty. Where does it come from? Where do we see it? Well, of course, we the people, the preamble of the Constitution is clear that popular sovereignty is the basis of the Constitution itself. And I think what's worth noting is that um, we've talked about the Federalist Papers, right? We've talked about the proponents of the Constitution, but the truth is that uh, both the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists, those who opposed ratification, talked a lot about popular sovereignty. What critics of the Constitution said was that the Constitution was insufficiently in, based in popular sovereignty. Their complaint was that it was too aristocratic, that it did not embrace democracy enough, it did not sufficiently uh, abide by rule by the people because in their minds, state institutions like the jury and the militia, those were popular sovereignty um, lived, right? Because uh, a jury, for instance, could check judges and had these extraordinary powers for citizens um, to check the laws of their country. And that was important. So we see uh, James Wilson. Yeah, oh, sorry, I was going to say, ahead. tell us about, so Omar, I mean, um, Mateo asked a really good question. So who sure. wrote the, the words, we the people, mm. and what were their kind of reasonings why they chose those words? Yeah, so we're seeing James Wilson here. There's there's two real sources. The other we, we mentioned before we got started, and that's Governor Morris, um, who really had a hand in writing uh, we the people. Um, James Wilson was uh, one of the um, uh, delegates from Pennsylvania. He was actually originally from Scotland. So he had been trained in the Scottish Enlightenment, which we, uh, we like to talk about is really important and influential on the founders. Um, and so Wilson maybe was the biggest proponent for popular sovereignty in Philadelphia. M Morris was certainly one of the biggest proponents too, but Wilson, across the board, you saw him uh, favor popular election for the presidency, popular election for both the Senate and the House of Representatives. Um, Wilson was just consistent on this notion that no, 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 the power starts with the people. We have to be consistent on that. Um, and he was during ratification as well, um, because his sense was this, uh, this is where legitimacy came from. And, um, we should ex essentially in some ways accept that that uh, created a form of majority rule because a lot of what you kind of see in these arguments between even Wilson and Madison, when we talk mm -hmm. about James Madison's concepts of conception of popular sovereignty is the degree to which we also want to uh, structure government in order to limit the excesses of democracy and majority rule, right? Um, so I do think that's important just to highlight too, attention there, right? There's, there is popular sovereignty, but then there's also the fears they had, which really go back to their understandings of antiquity, of the way in which uh, Greek and Roman um, Republican uh, and democracies fell apart, right? Yeah. Um, and like, so every student here will remember like, remember that class that you had or that <laughs> chapter that you read in your book around like, the Greeks and the Romans, like this is what they're looking at. This is what they're studying this time period and saying like, oh, they experimented with this idea of popular sovereignty. They didn't really put it through the way we are, but they're also really worried about rule of law, writing down the laws and being transparent and not having the government overstep its boundaries. Um, do you want to dive into rule of law next, Nick? Because I do feel like rule of law can be a trickier one for our students to kind of wrap around, or do you want to keep going a little bit with popular sovereignty and Lincoln. Um, I, I might want to give an example there, but I also was just trying to see, I saw some of the questions. I didn't know if we wanted to answer any of those. Dutch. Um, so it's not where the term governor comes from, but it essentially means a similar thing um, in his, uh, uh, in Dutch. So his, his family uh, went back to the 17th century. So that's where Morris got his name from. Um, and we'll talk about Andrew Jackson if we want for a little bit, since um, whether or not his type of popular sovereignty is different. Um, I understand where the question comes from. Uh, so I wouldn't say that it's different necessarily, but it, it does suggest um, what changed over 40 years. And what a, a real significant change was the broadening of, of voting rights, at least for white males who weren't property owners uh, throughout the United States. And that 
coincided with what we call Jacksonian democracy, this idea of um, the people having more of the voice, the president openly representing the people being the people's champion. Um, that was a really important uh, concept that Andrew Jackson certainly embodied. And so I think there's some tension there with certain founding fathers. So it's, it's actually a really good question because uh, Jackson certainly would have said, look, I'm, I'm following the revolution. I'm following the founding fathers. Uh, but of course, there are many very deep critics of his style because they thought it was too democratic in some sense, right? And that, that uh, the president should be openly um, uh, trying to be the people's representative over Congress in these battles of the branches. Uh, so that was some of their, uh, some critics dislike of Jackson's style. Um, and let's that be honest, about Jackson's idea of popular sovereignty was who? Who was he when, he, we're not thinking like popular sovereignty that we think today, he's talking about white males as the idea of who should have to be able to have the vote and be able to have voice and agency. Yeah, well, and I think it's also important to point out that Jackson himself, of course, didn't necessarily bring about some of these political revolutions, but the people really behind him, like Martin Van Buren, who was coming out of New York. Um, so yes, there's, there's ebb and flow here in terms of um, where political power is expanded and where, where is contracted, right? Um, and that's just, that's just true in the South in particular, right? Um, in which we see um, the curtailing of rights for free blacks um, and that includes voting rights and, uh, in a lot of states, including Pennsylvania, which I often mention. Um, and, but so we can also we talk about the uh, yeah, nullification have... crisis here if you want to no, get no, into no, the law. Before, I just wanted to show Jackson for that one. Sure, sure, so, sure. Um, real quickly, so the idea of, we started with the idea of popular sovereignty, that people have voice, people have agency. And this is the idea that we think of when we think of we the people and looking at Wilson and others who really kind of champion these ideas. Now, really quickly, I wanna do rule of law and then we'll end on natural rights and the Bill of Rights. So let's jump, and I, that was just to show you Jackson, but he, teaser, he's coming up again when we talk about rule of law. So when we think about rule of law, and you talked about this a minute ago, Nick, is that we're looking at this, these ancient times of Greece and Rome and saying, where does this concept of rule of law begin? These, our founding generation that writes the Constitution, writes the Bill of Rights and the Declaration, are looking to people from the past and saying, what were the good ideas and how can we cherry pick them? And then new ideas coming up from Rousseau and Locke about separation of powers and natural rights. So it's this amazing time period of pulling from the past and reinventing to make the new that brings up these big ideas and these values to our country. So give us a little kind of like two steps on rule of law, six minutes. Yeah, so Caligula is your showing here. I mean, this is an example we like to use. Um, our, uh, our honorary chair, the uh, Supreme Court Justice Neil Gorsuch has used this example before of the Roman emperor Caligula, who as I like to mention, uh, was well known because he put his uh, one of his horses in the Roman Senate uh, as an example of uh, just how corrupt he was. Um, but the point for uh, rule of law here was that Caligula uh, thought, look, the emperor writes the law um, and he's gonna write in such small prints and post it so up high on a pillar that no one could read it. And therefore they wouldn't know their legal responsibilities. Now, why is that arbitrary? Well, it means that anyone can just be punished for anything because people don't even know what the law is. They don't have access to it. So there's no stability to the law. It's on the basis of one man, right? The emperor in this case, which is what we call arbitrary or despotic power and rule. And, and so these examples were illustrative of what they deeply feared, right? As if there's one thing we don't want and whether it's the president or it was Congress who created tyranny, uh, tyranny would be in the form of arbitrary rule, which is not rule of law, right? So this is a very central foundation. So rule of the law, as I noted, it depends on stable laws. So these are laws that are noble to the people. 
They're possible and easy to understand in the fall, and they treat people equally and fairly, right? You have to give notice to people uh, to understand the law, right? And Curry suggested, right, this is something that was learned from the Enlightenment period, from the 17th and 18th century, that we see um, in early patriots in the run-up to the American Revolution who understand this problem, right? Uh, Parliament couldn't be arbitrary in its laws, and the king couldn't be either, right? They had to be um, held to the same equal law, right? So that that describes the basis of rule of law. Um, we do see it in parts of the Constitution's text. Um, for instance, one example would be uh, in Article 2, where the president has a duty to take care that the laws be faithfully executed. And he takes an oath, uh, he or she takes an oath to swear to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution, right? And so that suggests um, sort of the same concept of um, equal and just uh, distribution of the rules and the laws of the country. And uh, in Article 6, the Supremacy Clause, we see that this Constitution, right, and the laws of the United States um, and all treaties under it uh, will be the supreme law of the land, right? That's important because it, it states that no person or part of the government is above the law. And this is the supreme law of the land. And who created it ultimately? Again, right, we go to that popular sovereignty. It's we the people, right? We so, and yeah, I just want to add into this. I think it's fascinating to say like, okay, so no state can make a law that's too hard to understand and too unclear that is, that is more powerful than the constitution. And just to add to the fact that they really did want things that were clear. I mean, look at the Bill of Rights. When you read the Bill of Rights, I mean, yeah, definitely there's a lot of hard stuff in there too, but they're pretty clear. They're pretty clear. They're pretty transparent. We can all read them. We don't need eight law degrees to understand them. Maybe the nuance of them, but not everything. But true. the other thing is, and Nick, get, correct me if I'm wrong, isn't our constitution the shortest constitution ever written? I don't know if it's the shortest ever written, but it is particularly short because there are yeah, a lot of like constitutions that are in 5,000 words. Well, yeah. and the, I think the other thing to note, of course, is anytime this comes up is the English constitution was unwritten. Um, so there is no it has written to be written. English constitution. That, yeah, right. it has to be it's written. just precedent. So, oh, and uh, Michaela <laughs> asked another good question before we get into the next section of rule of law. Who started the idea of rule of law? Would it be like Hammurabi? Um, Hammurabi. It would be Hammurabi's yeah. code, I think, is usually thought of as kind of the first real true civil code or civil law. And that goes back to... I think what 3000 BC or so, roughly around then. So yeah, okay, uh, I think Hammurabi's code would, would be right, but there are plenty of examples of in, in antiquity. There's of course Justinian's code, for instance. So the founders would have been familiar with all these things. Um, and I think we should also mention Curry too, that you have uh, the ban on ex post facto laws and bills of attainder. That's also important too, because both of those are clear examples of what um, arbitrary laws would look like, right? An ex post facto law yeah. makes it a crime after the fact, right? If you, yes. you know, buy... You can't change the rules. Like yeah. that's like, <laughs> yeah, you can't change, you can't change the, rules the rules about the past. This feels right. like what I love about this, this idea of rule of law, it's like every fair game you ever played in, in a field. But yes. you know that the rules have to be clear. You know, you want them written. You know, if you're going to play a game, you want them written down, you want them fair. And you can't change it after the play is over. Like that's not. In cool. you, in the Bill of Attainers, you can't make the Curry law. You can't say Curry Sotner is illegal. Just for me. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> and I think that works really well with the Fourteenth Amendment too. Yes. Like the fact that there's equal protection of the laws, that the laws are equally distributed to everybody, but then you're also protected by those laws equally. Now, Nick, we have like one yeah. minute left, and I know you want to talk about Lincoln and how he wraps all three together. So go, bring us home. Yes, and I'll just say that on the 14th Amendment, because it's, it's, it's worth being clear about that, right, that the reason that is so important, equal protection, is because it's taking those underlying values that existed, both in the Constitution and the Declaration, and bringing them forward to everybody, right? So that's why we talk about the uh, second founding. I just want to make that clear, right? It's, it is important to see, right? is we're talking about values that existed, but the Equal Protection Clause is trying to take that 
and, and bring it to everybody, right? So that is actually, I think that's important to just um, uh, to bring that out, right? So with Lincoln, I think, yes, um, I actually think, uh, yes, natural law, of course, we want to bring them all together because Lincoln um, is our president, uh, Jeff Rosen likes to talk about. Uh, Lincoln quite famously um, in, 18, in February 1861, he gave a speech and at Independence Hall. And in that speech, he said that he, uh, rather than uh, abandon the principles of the Declaration of Independence, he would rather be assassinated on the spot. Um, Lincoln thought the Declaration, even over the Constitution, was more important in terms of the principles that it laid out. And one of the reasons why his career, the, Freder uh, the Lincoln-Douglas debates, for instance, were so important is because Lincoln's defense of African-Americans came from natural rights. It started with them. His whole point was, look, you can argue over whether or not they should have equal rights to vote or something like that. But that's not, I'm, that's not the question we're asking. What I'm saying is, look at the declaration. It says all men are created equal. Those are natural rights. And therefore, by virtue of being equal human beings, they have those basic rights. We cannot violate them because otherwise we would violate the principles that founded the country, right? And that, that was Lincoln's very basic point, right? You start with that premise is what he's trying to get his audience to see, right? And that, yeah, and I love the idea as you explain that story that, and how Lincoln laid it out is that it's not three parts. It's not stacking. They're really like a circle and they're yes. all connected. That people have agency and voice. You can take no rights away from people. Therefore, the rule of law applies to all people. And I love that kind of trifecta of a loop that that is, instead of thinking of things as one, two, three. Now to bring us home, there's a great question in the chat, everybody's chatting about. And the question is about rule of law applying to people. Can you be pardoned for something before you're convicted of it? And it's uh, Margie Cunningham's class started the question is, can you be pardoned? Can you pardon somebody before they do the crime? as the president, can you pardon somebody? And the example that was uh, brought up was, wasn't Nixon pardoned before he was found guilty? So he was help not. us understand what <laughs> he was not. <laughs> no, he was not. As the simple answer is that Gerald Ford, who took over for Nixon's last two years, um, rather uh, notably pardoned uh, the ex-president um, for uh, any crimes con um, commissioned in the uh, Watergate conspiracy. Um, it is worth noting that Nixon himself wasn't, I don't know that, he, uh, I th I'm trying to remember what crimes, if any, he was actually convicted of, because of course the, there was never an impeachment. The Senate never tried him and never found him because um, Nixon uh, resigned before any of that could happen. So um, he was pardoned before convicted. I would have to double check that. Um, I, I don't you know off the top them, of my head, and I do, <laughs> and I don't want to. I don't want to Google it. Well, I'm not an, <laughs> I'm not a Nixon. Uh, I know. Uh, no, no, it's all right to be stumped. This is why we're crimes all experts. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, don't worry. I don't uh, know either. Well, and I um, think Curry, the, the the real answer here is actually this is a debate amongst constitutional law scholars. I, th I think the more fundamental answer is regardless of what happened with Nixon, who was in fact pardoned, and I think he was pardoned because it was yes. Um, this my understanding is look, he could be convicted of other things. People are still interested in investigating him. This was 19, what, 74 to 75. Uh, people were still very upset with Nixon. Um, so, yes, it w I, I believe that what Ford did was to pardon um, any potential uh, future convictions on the basis of that particular set of facts. Uh, so, I do think that that can happen. Now the self-pardoning question Academy is separate. The Academy looked it up and said, um, the pardon says what crimes were committed or may have been committed. Yes. So he was, so, he yeah, was so that's pardoned yeah. for the crimes before the conviction. Awesome guys, I love that. Well, because remember um, a lot of the people involved in the conspiracy, the, the Watergate had in fact been convicted. Some of them had gone to prison. Um, so his associates had, so it suggested, yes, he might be found guilty. He's not the president anymore, so he doesn't have immunity, which is important, right? So now uh, anyone can go after him is a common citizen. Um, so that's part of the reason for the pardon. A self-pardon is a uh, separate question. Um, 
you know, in, in both these cases, uh, you know, constitutional law experts disagree about about the pardoning power. What's worth noting is that in Article Two, um, there aren't really any limitations on it. The text doesn't suggest anything other than the president has power to pardon. Um, I think we often talk about virtue. We would say part of the expectation here is probably that the president, um, there's a certain baseline and it's based in precedent, right? In experience and virtue in terms of what that power is used for. But textually there's no real limitations to it. So usually what we're, we're really talking about is expectations. Um, what we would say were kind of the, the original uh, meaning or uh, basis behind that text. What, what were the founders trying to do in giving, giving that power? And remember, there's also a power of commutation, which is separate uh, from pardon. But in, in any case, a self-pardon is something that you're hearing disagreement about right now. Uh, our podcast, We the People, will be discussing that this week. Uh, so you can go listen to that if you want to hear more about uh, the potential for a self-pardon. Um, it has not but happened. But it does, before. it kind of does push against the rule of law. Though, it it does, it does. I mean, the, what we would say here is there's a tension here. And that's exactly why when you're examining the pardon power, there's a difficulty because the text itself doesn't really give many limitations, but Curry is highlighting something important, right? Is we have what we would call background rules and guidance. So that's not just uh, values like virtue. It's also the sense that um, if the president did something that went against the rule of law, would that be a problem? That's a hard question. Yeah, um, exactly. It's a hard question. Yeah. So I love that you guys made this really modern and brought in that question. And now we all learn that you can be pardoned after, before a conviction, <laughs> but after yes. you commit a crime. Um, I, this is awesome. I love the chat. You guys are super smart. Um, well, actually, Curry, I, I just thought of another example. And I, I'll, I'll, I'm pretty sure that was true for the current president's pardon of Dinesh D'Souza. I think that's actually That's correct. what they shared in the chat. Got super Is that true? Ch- oh, I didn't even chat. see that. Isn't that right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so yeah, they agree. <laughs> he didn't they actually get back. convicted of a crime. So I. Yeah, exactly. He was, no. <laughs> um, yeah, exactly. So okay. if the crime, you get, you can be pardoned of a crime that you may have convicted. So, in yes. a, and so I guess the original question was, what if you before you do, could you be pardoned before you even do the crime? I yeah, think that might be too that's far different back. because what this yeah. is, what this exactly that's that's what we're trying to bring out is the, the difference here is they're saying we're thinking of crimes that you may have committed that someone might prosecute you for. Can you be yeah. pardoned for those? Pardons yeah. have been given on that basis for a future crime. That's that sounds like a science fiction novel. I don't. Um, you know, I believe that's a Tom Cruise movie. I don't know that. We... <laughs> so, so for future thought crimes, I, pr- I, I don't think so. <laughs> we don't think so on that. And then the third well, that'd be a rule of law problem is... too, wouldn't it? Because it would be saying yeah. you get a pass you... going forward to commit crimes. You can't pardon someone to allow them to commit crimes. That's not what a yeah. pardon does, right? So it'd actually so be a problem of what a pardon is supposed to be. Exactly. And that can then bring in the question of can you self pardon? That wasn't the yes. That wasn't the point of putting pardons into the Constitution and it would bulk the idea of rule of law. Um, so there's there's not enough clarity around it, but it's a great question. And we will share the podcast out with everybody so you have it. It'll be in the weekly wrap up. I just and wanted to mention that because that's they they can listen to more about it if they want to. Because uh we're yes, gonna have... no, a pardon, Amen, a pardon cannot be given you won't, would not be allowed to give a pardon for yes. a path to commit future crimes. So the answer is we're going to go with a solid no on that one. Um, but you can pardon somebody before they're convicted of a crime that they could have potentially been done or prosecuted for. And the third, the iffy gray question right now is, could a president pardon themselves? And a lot of people will say that it, no, because that would bulk the rule of law, but there's not enough clarity around it in the constitution, even though we do know that was not the, the intent. And can my, one might even say original intent of the use of the pardon, right, Nick? Yeah, I think that's a really definitely part of the examination going on is because the text doesn't give clarity to that. It doesn't really say very much. So uh, yeah, we are talking about the history and the purpose behind that power. And one might even say the foundations of our yes. democracy. <laughs> yes, yes. I mean, I, I think that's 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 certainly true because it would be in tension with popular sovereignty potentially too, because you would exactly. say, for instance, a pardon is an obligation to the people to pardon 
and give mercy to those who most deserve it amongst the citizenry, right? For instance, that's, yeah. uh, that's one way of interpreting it. Um, yeah. So you I can see how it'd be in tension with those other things. <laughs> exactly. And that's why we put these three together so you can kind of see how they ebb and flow and work together and then how actions can either and, support those or chip away. And we'll and say we that Iman's, now, yeah, yeah, so it says yeah. it could be not unconstitutional, but bad. Exactly, that's why it's hard, is because we can say all these things about why it might be a problem, but does that mean it's necessarily unconstitutional? This is exactly why it's actually a very hard question. We're, that's why we're gonna have a good conversation on the podcast about it, because I don't think it's obvious. Um, and that is that is what's difficult about it. And we are now 10 minutes over, yes. but you guys asked an awesome question. So that was really fun. Way to apply rule of law. Great I got question. Nixon right. <laughs> I didn't Google anything and you can tell. I didn't. Yeah, I, and they I checked it for you. Up. They checked it. <laughs> they Thank did. you guys. Thank you. Yes, the, the St. Eloge School checked it for us. So I'm going to stop the recording now. If you guys need to jump, you jump right away. If you have any follow-up questions, we will be here for a minute. Thank you so much and have a great, great week. Great having in class, everybody. All right.